Yeah, this, as Joanne indicated, is the first of four sessions. What I hope to do is uh, get people familiar with uh, methods of systematic reviewing, but at the same time bring up as many questions as I provide answers so that you will be aware of the yeah, uh, possible problematic aspects of a lot of things that go into uh, creating evidence that then is used to answer uh, questions. So I want to yeah, discuss what is considered evidence and why, how we, yeah, after we find evidence, we look at it, yeah, determine it's good, bad, or indifference, how then we synthesize it, and how in the last step uh, evidence is turned into recommendations for clinicians and other practitioners. Um, yeah, if you are familiar with issues of guidelines development, um, they pretty much yeah, turn to yeah, these three steps and then there is an yeah, additional step of yeah, writing guidelines. Um, in this series, we won't go as far. Uh, we have four topics. Today is more or less the basic, how yeah, it was developed, uh, the uh, yeah, qualification of evidence and basically was expressed in a pyramid. Next uh, time we will yeah, look at yeah, how AAN, American Academy of Neurology, and others have uh, developed yeah, uh, refinements on the basic um, pyramid, yeah, both uh, developing yeah, pyramids for questions other than yeah, what's the best treatment, um, and yeah, going beyond what I tend to call design with a capital D and look at design with a small d. Then the session after that, we will look at the great approach uh, which um, in, yeah, uh, involves many of the refinements that uh, the AAN has. As a matter of fact, in its latest versions, AAN is yeah, borrowing from the great people, um, but also very much yeah, look at how grades emphasizes the outcomes for people um, with a disability, yeah, people uh, who are served by practitioners as needing to be a primary item um, in developing yeah, guidelines. And yeah, then the fourth session that would be yeah, uh, what is it, six weeks from today um, we'll look at yeah, what else yeah, might be happening, needs to be happening, um, yeah, what can we expect um, yeah, to develop in the near future, yeah, and yeah, bring up issues of uh, what role should people who are active in disability and rehabilitation play in that, um, yeah, can we uh, develop this community of practice that Joanne was talking about to yeah, a degree that there is a yeah, continuous, ongoing, high-level dif discussion of um, issues of evidence and systematic reviews in general and their use in disability and rehabilitation uh, specifically. Any questions on any of this? Seeing nobody starting to type, I will 
quickly go the background. Uh, Diane, sorry, Joanne already indicated what I am and what I am with respect to uh, NIDRR research. Um, for the last 10 years, I have yeah, been very much uh, been focusing on yeah, the type of issues that uh, we will be dealing with evidence-based practice, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, uh, and stuff like that. And then, of course, Joanne will be yeah, our support person and yeah, uh, communicate with you and yeah, be the person to uh, send information to if you have any specific questions that you suggest are dealt with on a future session uh, or are turned into a future session. Okay, let's start with yeah. Um, what are the influences on a clinician's decisions? Well, first and foremost, that might be training and experience. And of course, these training and experience was provided by experts, yeah, directly or yeah, through textbooks and other information that yeah, experts provide, uh, which experts in and of themselves may not be up to date with the latest in clinical research. And I'm emphasizing yeah, clinical research because that's where we're going to be talking about. Yeah, it's this type of research that yeah, is to provide the evidence base. So yeah, the, these clinicians yeah get training in basic science, didactic clinical science, and lots of practicums clinical science. Yeah, um, and after they finish their school program, they will move into continuing education and various in-service training. And of course, um, yeah, people. Uh, as they practice in their own field, yeah, will have uh, their own experiences and built up expertise uh, based on what specifically works with their clients, um, subgroups of clients, etc. A second influence on a clinician's decision should, of course, be the values and preferences of yeah, patients or clients, yeah. what outcomes they want to achieve, what goals they want to achieve, uh, what are they are able and willing yeah, to do in order to achieve those goals to the degree that it's uh, within their ability. And then we get to what, yeah, more and more maybe a very strong influence on clinician decisions, yeah, society and the healthcare system, uh, driven by yeah, primarily underlying societal values that then get translated into how the healthcare system where a clinician or professional works in, yeah, uh, works within. Uh, laws and regulations that specify professional roles and privileges, um, the reimbursement for diagnostic treatment and management actions, and sometimes that also involves feasibility. Uh, if you don't have an MRI machine in your office, it may not be able to get one. And then there is the direct organizational mandates, and yeah, pretty much uh, any rehabilitation disability professional who hasn't hung out his or her own shingle yeah, works within an organization and very much the organization will dictate what people are allowed and are not allowed to deliver in terms of patient assessment, treatment, etc. And then lastly, we would hope that decision making would be very much guided by clinical research. And that can be primary studies, 
but because there is so much being published that it's impossible to keep up with, many yeah, people will rely on uh, what I have called EBP resources, which is systematic reviews, yeah, clinically assessed topics, uh, various journals that are now being published that have, yes, short summaries of primary studies with a clinical bottom line. Yeah, there is uh, additional types of uh, resources available. Um, yeah, the most important or terminal step yeah, probably is yeah, clinical guidelines. And I provide here the reference for some people who yeah, would read more, like to read more about them. So to the degree that clinical research yeah, is relied on to help people yeah, make decisions, it becomes quote unquote evidence. And now let's yeah, start looking what evidence is. Yeah. My dictionary. Yeah, tells me it's an outward sign, something that furnishes or tends to furnish proof, a medium of proof, yeah, a proof, a testimony, and that's presumably yeah, where we are dealing with when we get to these primary studies. And then, yeah, the archaic is the state of being evident, which ties in with yeah, the Latin roots of the word evidence, which goes back to videre to see. Yeah, clear, distinct, plain, visible, evident, as in the yeah, evidence middle step, and then resulted in evidentia, yeah, uh, the quality of being manifest, which may start suggesting to you that uh, not all evidence is the same whether as a single piece or in combination. Um, we yeah, always want to judge what is offered as evidence. How relevant is it here? Yeah, does it provide information for or against a specific proposition? Does it provide evidence relevant to a clinical question? Sufficiency is, yeah, it enough by itself, or does it need to be yeah, enlarged by, corroborated by other pieces of information on the same topic? And if I have one or more pieces of evidence, is it trustworthy? And we can look at yeah, internal proof that something yeah, may be weak, and we can look at yeah, external proof. Yeah, who put this evidence together? And what X may they have had to grind, and we will have opportunities to look at issues of conflict of interest. If you go to Wikipedia, there is an article on burden of proof, which pretty much is in the area of the law, and you may be aware of yeah, the fact that in legal uh, situations there are a number of uh, standards of evidence, yeah, running all the way from yeah the weakest, uh, the yeah, reasonable, yeah suspicion, yeah, through probable cause, some credible evidence, substantial evidence, in some cases, yeah, you need preponderance of evidence to find somebody guilty. It might be clear and convincing evidence. Sometimes the legal standard is beyond reasonable doubt, and it seems that beyond that there is even beyond the shadow of a doubt. Um, so we may want to yeah, 
not necessarily look for direct uh, evidence, uh, sorry, direct parallel to yeah, these nine possible grades in, within the law, but certainly keep in mind that not have all evidence is created equal. And yeah, we yeah, may need to have, yeah, before we make decisions on doing something or not doing something, <coughs> excuse me, as a practitioner, we may want to take a very hard look at yeah, the, the burden of proof, uh, yeah, what level, what quantity, what quality evidence do we have. Uh, and, yeah, warning, uh, when we get into the area of evidence practice, the term evidence can yeah, mean two things. Uh, it may be a single study, yeah, which then, in order to be evidence before or against a particular action, yeah, needs to be of relevance, of sufficient quality, etc., or it may be the body of all studies that are relevant, of sufficient quality, etc., etc., um, and preferably not just a raw body, but summarized or synthesized qualitatively or quantitatively. So you may want to yeah, uh, keep in mind that whenever you hear me say evidence or you read it, in literature that deals with um, yeah, evidence-based practice, uh, you can ask yourself, well, what are they talking about here? One piece of evidence, a single study, or a body of evidence? Uh, this is more or less a um, yeah, step back to when I talked about the influences on decisions. Yeah, ideally, the evidence-based practice process yeah, happens as follows. Um, yeah, the clinician practitioner starts with a question. What's the best way to diagnose yeah, something? What's the best way to treat that something? How should I be screening or is it worthwhile to be screening? Yeah. In order to yeah, give an answer to that, uh, either the practitioner herself yeah, needs to put the evidence together, or if he or she is lucky, there is already a body of evidence yeah, put together by a systematic reviewer, um, yeah, which provides an overview of the quality, the quantity, the variety of the evidence uh, as that is determined using specific criteria that still needs to be balanced by the practitioner with his or her own values, those of his organization, of his or her patients, costs other often are a big uh, consideration and there may be yeah, other things yeah, like feasibility and speed and yeah, lots of issues that yeah, determine what the answer yeah, to the question might be. Do we have questions this far? If not, don't be afraid to start typing while I start talking again because Joanne will call to my attention that a hand has been raised. Okay, we're going to go towards systematic reviews. And if you go to PubMed or MedLine, you will find their definition of review, which essentially yeah, means an article or book that yeah, reviewed published material on a particular subject. Um, and generally, when I say review, or when you read review uh, in the literature without uh, seeing the word systematic, it means a more traditional review and qualitative review 
uh, where somebody based on his or her your own uh, knowledge and preferences and uh, for all we know uh, in um, conflicts of inf uh, influence interest yeah uh, decides to make some recommendations as opposed to the definition of systematic review which I took from the uh, Equisar glossary. Uh, Equisar stands for assessment and quality, no, assessment of quality and applicability of systematic reviews. And the reference here is at the bottom of the page, yeah, which specifies that a systematic review synthesizes research evidence focused on a particular question, that's always what it starts off with, and follows an a priori protocol to first systematically find primary studies, to assess them for their quality, three, extract relevant information, four, synthesize this information qualitatively or quantitatively. And yeah, the glossary also yeah, the, uh, suggests that yeah, systematic reviews do yeah, review bias in the review process and doing so improve the dependability of the answer to the question through the use of a protocol, extensive electronic and manual literature search, very systematic, careful extracting of data and critical appraisal of individual studies. And generally, yeah, the extracting and of data and the appraisal yeah, done by two people independently, and if they have disagreements, those are resolved. So this also is taken from the Equisar manual uh, with an overview of yeah, the various steps. And I'll run through this very quickly. Uh, we start off with the focused clinical question in the bottom in green, yeah, which ideally leads to a systematic review protocol that is written before uh, the review itself is started. Ideally, the protocol is peer-reviewed itself, so that uh, yeah, experts yeah, look at it and say, how come you're not looking at, yeah, I suggest you also include in that type of stuff. Then in the blue column uh, row in the middle, we start with database searching, which is followed by scanning of the abstracts that were found. Uh, selected abstracts that are considered to be relevant are moved into a full uh, a next stage where we scan full papers. These papers are submitted to quality assessment where we look at how good was the research, um, either for all of them or for the better ones. We then next extract the information that is yeah, most uh, specific to the question, um, which next is synthesized qualitatively or quantitatively in a meta-analysis, uh, leading to a set of conclusions and recommendations. Uh, between the gray line and the blue row, we have uh, in white with red borders, uh, a list of the documents, forms, etc., that are used in these various steps, uh, very often uh, already created as part of the protocol, and certainly yeah, drafted as part of the protocol, but yeah, maybe finalized based on yeah, some later issues. And then at the very top, we have some steps in yellow, bo yellow boxes with the blue border, 
that yeah, refer to steps in the systematic reviewing process that yeah, are very much recommended, but yeah, not always yeah, done. One is yeah, inquiries from experts. Yeah, you find people who are experts in a particular area and say, yeah, what else do you know? What studies are you aware of? that yeah, may not have been published, not have been published yet, but we should be looking at. Ancestor searching is simply once you have in your database searching found applicable papers, you go to the reference list and see whether there's additional studies there <coughs> that you might not have found. Journal hand searching is almost never done, but that's actually sitting down with yeah, 40 years of the Journal of Disability Studies and yeah, leafing from item to item in the table of contents to see whether something there that's relevant. Um, very often, the information in published studies is yeah, not sufficient, not detailed enough uh, to either assess the quality or it leaves out information that we would like to have in our evidence table. So there is communication with authors. And then lastly, there is peer review, uh, which can refer to initially review of the protocol, but later on review of the report, yeah, which um, yeah, here I yeah, will focus on as consisting of the evidence tables and the conclusions recommendations. Uh, in a yeah, slightly different view, here we start out with an entire dem bibliographic database all of Cinehill, all of PubMed, what have you, yeah, using keywords and thesaurus terms, etc., we split that content into two pots, yeah, uh, things that are possibly relevant versus everything in there that's irrelevant. Then we have ideally two or more people yeah, look at uh, the abstracts using a few fairly broad terms. Yeah, and yes, uh, now separate the pile of abstracts into a smaller pile that yeah have promise, and a very big pile of stuff that's all irrelevant. Next, we get a copy of all the promising papers and again have two or more people look at each one yeah, with now yeah, fairly well-defined yeah, narrow terms and make a final selection on applicable studies and irrelevant studies. And the last step, yeah, we have yeah, again, two or more people uh, extract information that inform yeah, the quality of the studies, whether that's internal validity or external validity, generalizability. And yeah, uh, that information, at the minimum, yeah, is used in the rest of the uh, systematic reviewing um, sometimes uh, people throw out yeah, all the poor quality studies, and we'll have more about that to say soon. Uh, more commonly, um, yeah, high, medium, and low quality studies are all kept, but yeah, how they are used for uh, decision making is different, as you would not be surprised. Yeah, if we're looking at quality of evidence, yeah, we have high quality studies should count for more than medium or low quality studies. Questions on any of this? 
no. Okay, now let's start looking more in detail about yeah, determinants of the quality of the evidence. And here I am talking about yeah, the individual primary study. Yeah, first of all, of course, is research design. And this is design with the capital D. Yeah, is this study a randomized clinical trial? And I will be using the term RCT without uh, wasting my time on yeah, fully expanding that term. Yeah, or is there an RCT with a crossover? Is it a yeah, study with historical controls? Is it only a pre-post study? Is it a single subject design? Yeah, and if so, what specific type of single subject design? Might it be regression discontinuity design, time series, etc.? Uh, knowing yeah, that overall design of a study you already yeah, know a lot about the uh, quality of the evidence that you, in general, might expect. But yeah, there are, of course, yeah, other issues to be considered. Yeah. What's the quality of the outcome measures that are being used? Is this a homemade measure of some outcome? Or are the uh, researchers using a very well-known, well-studied uh, outcome measure with very good psychometric uh, elements? If it is an intervention study, what's yeah, the intervention? And what's the quality control of, on the intervention? Yeah, are they doing any... Yeah, monitoring of the fidelity of the actual yeah, provision of the intervention. And then a big issue is blinding. Yeah, are the people who do the intervention blinded uh, for diagnostic studies? We have similar issues in blinding that, say, the person who... Uh, does the diagnosis with a new measure should be blind to the diagnosis provided by the gold standard measure. We could talk about blinding of the subjects, patients, clients. If there is an independent assessor, which is always to be uh, preferred, uh, that person yeah, should be and always can be blinded. We can blind the statistician. And then to yeah, have better outcome analysis statistically, we may apply in assigning subjects to uh, study arms. We may do such things as blocking, stratifying, matching. So all of this yeah, could be, should be, in the proposal for research. But once you start doing the research, plenty of stuff can go wrong. And yeah, in order to look at evidence and the quality of evidence, we should very much yeah, be aware of, be informed by yeah, what happened to, during the implementation of the research. Yeah. What was the number of subjects they actually recruited and how did that relate to the target number that they specified yeah, specifically by power analysis? And I should maybe have put power analysis on the previous slide. Was there any bl failure of the blinding that yeah, either clinicians or patients or assessors break the blind? How much attrition was there? And is there any suggestion that this attrition was not random, but yeah, specific. And we pretty much know that attrition almost never is random. Yeah, certain subgroups of people disappear. What, yeah, how many missing data do we have, and what's the nature of the missingness? Is this completely at random? Yeah, very specific, or somewhere in between? 
and statisticians have developed nice ways to look at this. Um, even if yeah nothing went wrong, yeah we have yeah the issue that with sample sometimes we have an unlucky hand with sampling, and the people that end up in our study happen to be people who in general have bad outcomes, and another time we have issues that people uh, tend to have poor outcomes. And yeah, at least when we have uh, used yeah, GOAT um, methods for distributing people over study arms, uh, we have opportunities to uh, apply inferential statistics and come up with some confidence intervals yeah, telling us what are yeah, the limits that likely the uh, true values for the population lie. Um, yeah, whether or not we had an unlucky hand with sampling fluctuations, um, yeah, the research implementation yeah, ideally should be intent to treat, but very often people report per protocol which creates problems and weakens the evidence. And then yeah, sometimes yeah, they not just go per protocol, but yeah, go on complete fishing expeditions, which yeah, means that they may publish yeah, one of 20 outcomes because that one happened to be statistically significant. And the other 19 was no difference, and they stick in the drawer. So that's what you're up to if you have to evaluate the quality of research in order to yeah, determine what its value might be um, is evidence. Yeah. Um, so we have to find some way to yeah, um, look at that on the level of an individual study. Now, for a systematic review, we generally are dealing with a number of studies, not just one, but hopefully yeah, 5, 6 to 10, 20. And yeah, now when we start looking at yeah, the quality of the evidence overall, we have to look at yeah, what's the number of studies, what was the quality, the grade of these individual studies, how large were these studies individually and combined, what's the overall number of subjects. Yeah. What were their findings, and are the findings consistent, or do we have one third that found no difference between experimental group and control group, one third that found that the treatment was effective, and one third that found that the treatment made people worse? Well, good luck if you have that situation. Yeah, we need to know the effect sizes of individual studies, and we need to be able to calculate an average effect size, at least yeah, when the various studies yeah, do not point in all directions, but maybe just in two, yeah, some in different, some in favor. Um, and then, of course, we yeah, again have to, yeah, maybe before we start synthesizing, yeah, uh, answer questions on applicability. Yeah. Did all these studies deal with the same population or draw from the same population? Yeah. Did they all handle similar outcomes? Yeah. Are those, yeah outcomes, patient-valued outcomes, or proxy measures. And proxy here, I do not mean that the answers to questions were provided by an 
family member, but I'm talking about a proxy for a real life outcome. Yeah, if um, the real life outcome is um, yeah ability to uh, yeah m uh, move one's limbs in spite of arthritis. Uh, then a proxy might be a certain serum level of a um, uh, chemical that may be related to uh, severity of the arthritic process, but cannot stand in for an outcome that patients valued themselves. So that's a proxy outcome. And we have the issues of if it's an intervention study, yeah, did all the studies use yeah more or less the same intervention, and yeah, is it yeah feasible? Okay, I yeah uh, about twenty slides back referred to the issue of yeah, uh, unsystematic reviews, the qualitative ones, where authors pick the primary studies randomly, the authors weight the primary studies randomly. Yeah, they could just say, well, yeah, this study wasn't very good, so I'll disregard its findings without yeah, necessarily uh, having a priori standards for a what is good and b yeah, how much you should discount the value of a weak study and a as I indicated might draw conclusions that yeah might correspond well to their prior convictions yeah, uh, fit with their interest and what have you. Uh, the first meta-analyses were done in the social scientists, in the social scientists, and initially, yeah, people just yeah found some studies and combined them without really looking systematically, evaluating them systematically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, systematic reviewing pretty much was invented in medicine in the 1980s. Um, where yeah, a lot of the stuff we do now as part of systematic reviewing yeah, was first developed to yeah, uh, make the whole process of reviewing and synthesizing the evidence into a yeah, careful step-by-step -step process that is very transparent so that people can see what you did, why you did it, how you did it, what the criteria you used, etc., etc. And as part of yeah, this invention, quote unquote, of yeah, systematic reviewing and evidence-based medicine, the first classification, to my knowledge, of yeah, primary studies in terms of their strength of evidence was yeah, created by Sackett in 1986. And Sackett is a physician that was active, still is active at McMaster University in Ontario, which we may call a hotbed of uh, evidence-based practice. And yeah, they have made many major contributions. Okay, in a 1986 paper which was focused on uh, treatment for chest disorders or diseases, uh, Sackett, to my knowledge, pretty much ad hoc and without prior work, although yeah, if I were to go talk with him, yeah, he may set me straight on that account. Yeah, came up with yeah five levels. First of all, yeah there are RCTs with low false positive and low false negative errors. Yeah, what we now call high power studies with yeah alpha at 0.05 or less 
and beta at 0.20 or less. Yeah. Second is studies that are still RCTs, but they yeah, lack uh, yeah, power. RCTs is randomized controlled trials. And yeah, make a note of that because I will tend to not use the full expanded word. I'll just yeah, talk about uh, RCTs. Um, third level is yeah, any study that didn't ra randomize but yeah, compared between a treated group and a non-treated group, but it had to be a contemporaneous group, yeah, which separates it from level four, where again there is a comparison between a treated and a non-treated group, or maybe between the, treat, the group that got the new type of treatment, the new invention, versus the people who got the old treatment. Uh, but in this case, those are people in the past. Yeah, information on them was harvested from clinical records or from old research. And then lastly, we have yeah, level five uh, case series without controls, uh, just a group of people who were all treated with yeah, the proposed new treatment and based on the results, yeah, the investigator says, hey, this is much better than we used to have. Here's where we got, yeah, evidence hierarchy or evidence, sometimes you hear the pyramid. Yeah, from the very highest at the top, RCTs, then cohort studies, then case control studies, then case series, and case reports. Now, Sackett, in the same paper, related this to levels of evidence and grades of recommendation. Yeah, or better said, he yeah, related level of evidence to a grade of recommendation. Yeah, he had a grade of recommendation A, which is the strongest. Yeah, the criteria was that there would be at least one, preferably more, level one RCTs. Then there's a grade B, and we'll look at the second at what those grades mean. Uh, for that, he required support by at least one level two RCT, and then C supported yeah, only by level three, four, or five. So I managed not to yeah, put in what the grades mean. Okay, uh, we presumably will fix this problem when this is uh, archived for uh, permanent status on the website. Um, yeah, but imagine, yeah, it's something along the line, yeah, grade A supported by at least one, preferably more, high-level RCTs. This is something you should do. Grade B, yeah, supported by at least one level two. This is something that you may want to do. And level C is something that yeah, you are at liberty to do or yeah, you are free not to do. And Mr. Grubbs or Ms. Grubbs is typing something. Mixed method studies. They do not fit in at all at this point in time. Uh, at yeah, the time that uh, Sackett was uh, publishing and other people were inventing um, systematic reviewing, 
qualitative research didn't exist, mixed method studies didn't exist. Um, I will make a note of uh, this question and make sure that yeah, we hit the issue at some point uh, uh, later on, probably in the fourth session. So, nothing right now. Okay. Now, this is what often happens you know, with sackets levels or even with other schemes. Yeah. People make a dichotomy between RCTs and the rest of the world. And yeah, if there are RCTs, they are the basis for making recommendations. And if you do not have an RCT, you don't have anything and you make no recommendation. This still, to some degree, is maybe not the official policy of the Cochrane collaboration, but certainly the drift of many of the groups in Cochrane, um, where they do a careful yeah, search of literature, yeah, evaluate the various studies, discover that none of them is an RCT, and come up with the conclusion there is nothing to recommend because yeah there is no high quality evidence goodbye folks yeah and yeah we will have to yeah discuss opportunity to discuss um, things like this um, yeah very much starting next week um, or even yeah, over here. Um, many of you, uh, certainly the people who work for ASHA, and I saw three ASHA staff members on the list of people who plan to participate, uh, may have heard of the work that Cicerone et al. have been doing in um, systematically reviewing any and all research that has something to say about uh, interventions for cognition and communication in people with traumatic brain injury, stroke, and yeah, some very closely related disorders. And Cicerone too has a um, uh, hierarchy, but it has only three levels. At the top, he has well-designed prospective RCTs. Don't know how you ever could have retrospective RCTs, but that's a different story. With true randomization, yeah, or with quasi-randomization, which, yeah, are some schemes, yeah, that mean that the people who yeah, want uh, come for treatment on Monday, are uh, assigned to treatment A, and the people who come on Tuesday are uh, assigned for treatment B. Uh, research has shown that yeah, these quasi uh, schemes uh, very often are abused, and the end result is not quasi. So, yeah, Dr. Cicerone may want to yeah, re review this and maybe change his criteria. Uh, number two level, uh, prospective non-randomized cohort studies, yeah, retrospective non-randomized case control studies, cl clinical series with well-designed controls, that permitted between subject comparisons of treatment conditions, yeah, such as multiple baseline across studies. Uh, so except maybe yeah, the single subject designs, this pretty much coincides with um, Sackett's 
yeah, level Roman two, Roman three, and Roman four. And then we have a third level for uh, Cicerone, clinical series without concurrent controls, uh, results single cases uh, with uh, appropriate single subject, multiple baseline, with adequate quantification analysis of the results. Uh, relationship 27, 29, uh, this is 27, I went back to these Romans, um, are not the same as Cicerone's three Romans, yeah, pretty much one of Sackett coincides with one of Cicerone, Two, three, and four of sackets yeah, coincides with two of Cicerone, and five of sackets cor corresponds with Roman three of Cicerone. And yeah, that's a problem that yeah we have in the systematic reviewing world that there are a number of hierarchies and uh, they all have different number of levels, and even if they have the same number of levels, the meaning not necessarily is the same. So, yeah, if somebody tells you we have level two evidence, you always have to go and say, what does level two mean? Yeah. Pretty much it means what is the big D of design. Very often some of the little Ds yeah, get into the mix too. So this is what Cicerone uh, did with, based on the level of recommendations. And the reference is below. Yeah. But yeah, he distinguishes practice standards, practice guidelines, and practice options. And practice standards, you need to have one well-designed class one study with an adequate sample or overwhelming class two evidence. Yeah, of course, directly addressing the effectiveness of the treatment in question, uh, good evidence to support a uh, recommendation, yeah, whether the treatment should be specifically yeah, considered. Practice guidelines yeah, is uh, uh, at least two well-designed class two studies with adequate samples, yeah, directly addressing the question, fair evidence, yeah, um, and yeah, it's a suggestion but not something that you should do, and then yeah, practice options class two or three based, yeah, uh, with yeah, some additional grounds to support it. And yeah, in the end, it is still something that yeah, is an option and nobody should yeah, look at you yeah, ugly if you as a clinician yeah, decide not to follow uh, the recommendation and use this intervention. Uh, big D versus little d, uh, I addressed that previously. Big D is what we call generally designed randomized clinical trial versus case control study versus uh, cohort study versus pre-post study, etc. Uh, design with a small d. Um, I refer to as all the other options that make a study yeah, within its big D category stronger or weaker. Did you do blinding? Did you have great outcome measures? Um, yeah. How did you plan to analyze per protocol or intent to treat? And then issues of actual implementation what's your attrition level, what's your missing data level, etc.
questions? Uh, Rachel Esparza is typing. It's and thank you. Okay. So we are yeah, close to the end of this. Yeah. Well, if there is so much yeah, difference between studies based on their design with either the big D or the small d, yeah, how can we use that information yeah, in the uh, classification of studies? And you already saw that uh, Sackett and um, Cicerone yeah, basically only use the big D, although yeah, there are some qualifications on this. For instance, Sackett yeah, uh, refers to yeah, big enough to yeah, give you uh, acceptable um, alpha and beta yeah, error levels. Um, yeah, Cicerone has some other qualifications uh, of studies, but basically, yeah, they use only the big D design. Now, there's a lot of people who have yeah, suggested that we should do more than just use big D. We should look at the little d elements. And yeah, one of them was a fellow called Jadad, and I'm not giving the reference because uh, this is pretty much yeah outdated. And even though I still see people referring to it, um, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to use it. Jadad essentially has five questions. Is the study described as randomized? And this pretty much yeah, is looking at only abstracts. But even if it's yeah, you have the full text, you can answer these questions. Is the study described as randomized? It doesn't ask, is the study randomized? No, no, it's described as randomized. So the next time you do a sloppy case study, yeah, Call it randomized, and Mr. Jadat will be fooled. Question two. Is the method of generating the randomization sequence appropriate? And this ties back into such things as uh, were uh, Cicerone would accept for his level one uh, a study that used quasi-randomization. Uh, Jadat yeah, would not accept that and would only yeah, accept true randomization, which yeah, isn't even flipping a coin, but yeah, either you have prepared sequence envelopes with a number, and after, only after, you have informed consent, you open an envelope and see what the subject is assigned to. Or after you have informed consent, you call the pharmacy, and the pharmacy tells you, yeah, your next patient will be put on drug or put on placebo. Question three, is double blinding used? So he's referring only to blinding of the uh, investigator or the people who administer treatment, and to the patient, the subject, the client. We will have a lot to say about double blinding because in most studies in rehabilitation and disability, blinding is yeah, plain impossible, which <coughs> has major implications for how our studies I looked at by all these scales to look at the quality of evidence. Number four is the method of double blinding appropriate. Yeah, did you indeed manage to put a blindfold on that was yeah, not likely to 
yeah, be broken. For instance, yeah, there are certain drugs that not just do good things in your body, uh, but also leave a dry mouth. Well, you have to tell the patients on beforehand that yeah, the drug, the experimental drug, may give them a dry mouth, but then if they get yeah, placebo and do not have a dry mouth, they pretty much know they're on placebo. So, yeah, what to do? Well, the best studies, yeah, administer to the placebo group an inert drug that has only one effect, creating a dry mouth. And that's why you have an yeah, appropriate method of blinding. And there's other tricks like that. Number five, is there a description of withdrawals and dropouts? Again, notice it doesn't say are there too many withdrawals, are there too many dropouts, but just is there a description? So if you honestly describe that 60% of your treatment group and 67% of your control group dropped out, that's fine with Mr. Jadat. Among you, people who are in the physical therapy area, uh, may have heard of the Pedro scale. And as usual, I have forgotten what Pedro stands for, but I think P is for physiotherapy, E is for evidence. Uh, don't know what D is, but without any doubt, Joanne remembers, and she will type it in. Pedro consists out of 11 things. Here's 8 through 11. Here is, yeah, 1 to 7. Uh, number 1 is not scored on the scale, yeah. uh, but because the Pedro items came from a specific uh, Delphi exercise uh, where one of the items was the eligibility criteria specification. Uh, they kept it as a non-scored item. Number two, yeah, random allocation. Number three, concealed allocation, which pretty much means nobody yeah, knows which arm the subject will be assigned to. Yeah, until after yeah, the person has consented to be in the study. Number four, similar at baseline. <coughs> if you have a study with very small groups, yeah, you may end up that in your treatment group, eight out of ten people are male, and in the control group, three out of ten people are male. They are unbalanced. Well, a requirement in Pedro is that, yeah, they are balanced, yeah, regarding at least the most important prognostic indicators, yeah, those factors that are expected to have an impact on outcomes. Blinding of all subjects, blinding of all therapists who administer the therapy, blindness of all assessors. If a study didn't use assessors, but either subjects themselves fill out a questionnaire, they are the assessors, and if they weren't blinded, the assessors weren't blinded. If, on the other hand, it's the therapist who rates the functioning of the patient, and the therapist is the assessor, and the therapist isn't blinded, the assessor isn't blinded. Measures of at least one key outcome were obtained for more than 85% of the subjects initially allocated. So unless your dad, who just says, I want a report of who dropped out, how many, yeah, Pedro says, if you have more than 85% dropout, uh, you're in trouble. You cannot be a perfect study. Uh, some other people are using 80%, just for your information. Uh, number nine, all people for whom outcome measures were available received the treatment or the control condition, 
as allocated. There was no yeah, erroneous switching or on purpose switching. Well, Mrs. Jones, you ended up in the control group, but as I see that you very much need a good treatment, we decided to put you in the experimental group. No, no, that's a no-no. And if that happens on purpose or sometimes by accident, people have to be analyzed yeah, by the group they were originally assigned to, not the group that yeah, they were treated as. Number 10, yeah, uh, between group statistical comparisons are reported for at least one key outcome. And number 11, the study provides both point measures and measures of variability for at least one outcome. And that means don't just give the mean for the uh, experimental group and the control group, but give the mean and the standard deviation, because then we can calculate an effect size. Yeah. If you control percent cured, a percent yeah, is an effect size by itself. So there's 10 items on which you can score 0 or 1. So the Pedro scale gives you a total score between uh, 0 and 10. Now, <clears throat> both Jadat and Pedro are checklists, sorry, are rating scales. They have a set of items, then count the number of yeses, yeah, or add up yeah, ones and zeros and come up with a score. There are other people who just use a checklist but yeah, not necessarily yeah, add up items. They just want to know yeah, what are the weaknesses of this particular study. Yeah. And once they have that information, yeah, they uh, do other things yeah, like yeah, saying, OK, this is an important item. The rest are not that important. This is an important item, and if you don't have a positive on this particular item, I am throwing out your study. Or, yeah, if you do not have this particular item, we consider you a level two uh, study. For instance, in both Cicerone and um, Sackett, if you do not have randomization, you cannot be a level one study. You can at most be a level two study. Yeah. So <clears throat> we can use yeah, the item information to eliminate studies, to weigh studies, yeah, or sometimes even do a sensitivity analysis where yeah, you um, Start with yeah, looking at what is the pooled result for all the studies. Now, what happens if I throw out the studies that didn't use blinding? Okay, this happens to the average effect size. Now, what happened, happens if I throw out all the studies that, in addition, do not have true randomization? Ah, this is what's happening. So, yeah, more or less determine whether it makes a difference whether or not you are weak or strong or one or more of those items. I suppose, say, yeah, the rating scales, whether that's Pedro or Zedat and there is others, yeah, that yeah, combine items on those scores to calculate and study quality score. Um, and why do I say use individual items? This should be combined items. Joanne, will you make a note that we should fix this? Uh, the combined items. For instance, you will read 
many studies out of physical therapy where they used the Pedro scale and said, okay, we threw out any studies that had a Pedro score of less than six. Um, and it doesn't matter what keeps you away from perfect, whether it's lack of blinding or lack of yeah, concealment or <coughs> lack of uh, intent to treat analysis. If you lose more than four points, you're out. Of course, the score can also be used to weigh studies and to do a sensitivity analysis yeah, along the lines uh, I just mentioned. And a big issue that nobody except for one person in the literature has talked about is, well, is adding up items the best way to handle it? Yeah, that's what we're used to. Yeah, because that's what we do in the FIM and all kinds of other things. Um, but maybe we should use the lowest item. Now, with a 0-1 scale, the lowest item yeah, means yeah, the, if one item has a 0, yeah, the total score is 0. But there are other uh, scales, for instance, the black and down scale, that has... Yeah, 20 plus items scored on three levels or more that yeah, could use other methods. You could think of multiplication of items. Again, when you multiply with items that have a zero possibility, yeah, one zero turns the yeah, product zero, so that's no good. But there's other ways yeah, to uh, do better than some scoring. And maybe we can talk more about that. So, questions. Anne has filled in in the meantime that Pedro means physiotherapy evidence database. Where they get the RO from, I have no idea. And... Uh, if somebody can, can resolve that, that would be nice. Probably they just use it because it was easier to remember Pedro than Ped, or they wanted to avoid confusion with pedestrians. And Debbie Hubbard is going to give the... What's the most used, commonly used skill, Pedro? Um, no, uh, you see the Jadat scale used, you see the Pedro scale used, uh, you see what I refer to as the black and down scale used, um, yeah, both uh, the Jadat scale and the Pedro scale yeah, almost all your points come from randomization and blinding. Um, well, yeah, we in rehabilitation and disability studies have yeah, problems having yeah, blinding. Um, we still can do randomization, but sometimes even that is yeah, problematic or not ethical. Very often we cannot do blinding. There are other areas of healthcare where they have similar problems, behavioral medicine, uh, public health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so very often they do not have yeah, any RCTs or not many good RCTs, um, but have also case control studies and they prefer to use a rating scale that yeah, looks at more under the sun Horatio than just randomization and blinding. And then, yeah, black and downs is a very good measure to use, yeah, even though it's quite lengthy. Um, and, yeah, there are additional... Um, um, yeah, rating scales 
that uh, yeah, may be yeah, used in particular areas of healthcare um, yeah, or in particular countries. Uh, I would not, off the top of my head, yeah, want to uh, make a judgment as to which one is used overall and not even which one is used in areas uh, that um, yeah, I'm more familiar with, yeah, for instance, disability and rehabilitation research. And Joanne has found that they added the RO to make Pedro catchy, just as I thought. Okay, this is it for today. Miracle of miracles. We ended within the hour and a half. Uh, thank you for participating, even though it, your participation yeah, was nothing more than listening and yeah, asking questions when yeah, what I did was yeah, what I showed or uh, talked about was not clear. Uh, we invite you to provide input on today's session. And yeah, at the bottom of the page is the link to the evaluation form. Yeah, that will take you less than five minutes. Uh, share your ideas for future sessions. Uh, that can be either information that fits into the next three topics that you hope uh, and pray that I will address, yeah. or it may be something that's much bigger, and certainly yeah, Joanne and uh, her colleagues have no problem with yeah, extending the series. Um, we may not be able to do it right after number four, because I'm vacationing, but uh, yeah, we certainly can have a longer series with some interruption or with a longer interruption and start a new series. Um, yeah. Start yeah, asking questions of one another. Start reporting yeah, to one another as to what you're doing, uh, what the problems are that you are having in doing systematic reviews or uh, employing systematic reviews and yeah, let us see what we can help. So for any issues, um, contact Joanne and yeah, we will have uh, you as our internet guest in 14 days. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dykers. That was a wonderful presentation, and thank you to everyone for participating today. We hope you found the session to be informative and that you'll join us for the next three webinars. Um, as um, Marcel mentioned, we do have a brief evaluation form and would really appreciate your input. The link is on the last page, and we will also be sending an email with a link to that evaluation form. And as a reminder, we'll make the recording of today's session available in a few days. Um, on this final note, I'd like to conclude today's webinar with a big thank you to Dr. Marcel Dykers from myself, Ann Williams, and all of the staff at the KTDRR. We also appreciate the support from NIDR to carry out the webinars and our other activities. We look forward to your participation in session two on June 18th. Good afternoon and goodbye.